guys, and welcome to the Money Podcast. This episode, we're talking about common pearls of financial wisdom. <laughs> For example, you've probably heard that you should buy a used car instead of a new one. But used car prices surged 21% from early 2021 to early 2022. So does that advice really make sense, at least for everyone? We hear a lot about what the experts recommend, but does it make sense for you? Let's take a look at some of some common sense financial advice and talk about whether or not we think it's a good idea, at least among us. I'm Stacey Johnson. As usual, my co-host will be financial journalist Miranda Marquette. Hey, Miranda. Hey, Stacey. I'm ready to talk about all of the things I do wrong and turn in my personal finance card. All right. That makes sense to me. I'm ready to turn mine in, too. I'm holding it right here. Oh, wait. I dropped it. Anyway, <laughs> listening in is sometimes contributing as producer and novice investor Aaron Freeman. Hello, Aaron. All right. Let's hear some wisdom. Let's do. Let's get the ball rolling. But first, a quick disclaimer. Should we discuss specific investments in this show, you do not take them as recommendations. Why? Because they're not. Before you invest in anything, you've got to do your own research. You've got to make your own decisions. Okay, let's get back to our topic today. Financial pearls of wisdom that may or may not be accurate. Uh, Miranda, lead us off. Give me an example. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest ones that uh, that I I personally get in trouble with is everybody says always buy used, right? Once you drive the car off the lot, it depreciates by a you know thirty percent, and so. I think the issue with always saying always buy used um, kind of gets people in this situation where they may or may not end, and and they say buy with cash too, buy used with cash, and so then you end up yeah, so the car's still depreciating even when you buy it used, and now your liquidity is all locked up in this car, and so I actually do it different. Uh, I buy new and I buy with low interest credit. And it doesn't work for everybody. And you have to have a certain risk tolerance for this business. But I drive my cars for 10 years. I buy new. They, I have to worry less about repairs and breakdowns and all that kind of stuff. My money is still in the market. It's still very liquid. And I get a better return that beats my 2.49% uh, interest rate. So, so I just actually, to be clear, then, are, yeah. are, you saying, are you saying this is bad advice to buy a used car? I'm saying it's bad advice for me. <laughs> I'm saying not, okay, I'm okay. saying it doesn't work for everybody. I mean, so I, I'm saying like it doesn't always work, and sometimes the numbers don't come out in your favor. And, and and this is kind of the theme of this podcast. And correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, but it's it's really not that this, the common pearls of wisdom are wrong. It's that they may not be right for you specifically. Is that is that exactly. accurate? Okay. Yeah, cool. exactly. Because now, see, I I disagree with you, and we've had this we've had this discussion many times on this podcast. I I do believe in buying used cars, uh, and not just cars for that matter. Lots of other things, but we'll stay to, stick with cars for now. Uh, I have never. It, it owned depends a new on the time, though, doesn't it, Stacey? Doesn't it depend on the time? I mean, uh, what do you mean? There was a there was a there's a point here, and it kind of still is that used vehicles have actually surpassed new vehicle prices. Yes, yes, yep. yes, that is definitely true. But I mean, in general, you know, in in my <laughs> what what am I sixty six years old? So I've been driving cars for fifty years. This is the first time that used cars have been more expensive than new cars. Yeah, right. And actually, and, and the reason I, that is yeah, is because yeah. new cars weren't available. Yeah, right. Okay. And that's but the thing I, I've heard I've, I've read article that 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 bubble has actually popped. They're starting to they're starting to come back down. Yeah, you know, uh, t taking this to the extreme, you guys, I have a friend. His name is Ralph, and you know what he's been doing for the last year and a half? He's been buying new cars and selling them for twenty five grand more than he paid for them. He just drove up to my house the other day in a brand new Corvette. Yeah. And now nice. he, what he's doing is he's buying he's buying a car. You know, he's waiting nine months for it, and then by the time it reaches him, it's it's worth more than he paid for it. So he yeah. he's been buying brand he's new buying, cars. He's buying a factory direct. Yes, and he's yes. getting a discount on it. Yes. and then he's Without waiting factory for the value direct, of it to go up it from a dealership. But he, he'll yeah. he'll take it from the dealer. He drove up, to, and this is a beautiful car. Oh my God, it was beautiful, gray with a red leather interior. Drove it up to my house, um, and then he sold it back to the same dealer for twenty grand more than he paid for it, because that dealer's going to turn around and sell it again for forty grand more than than he paid yeah. for it. So, I mean, this is this is an absurd scenario we're in. And sooner or later, you know, the music's going to stop like musical <laughs> chairs and Ralph's going to end up holding a car that's not worth as much as he paid for it. But, uh, but, it, but you know, so but this is an odd scenario. But generally speaking, I, I, I bought one new car my whole life, and that was for Sarah, my wife. Um, but I've never owned a new car. And, and I think uh, it's hard for me. I drive nice cars. I drive Mercedes. I drive a car that cost $110,000, but I paid forty five dollars for it. So I let some other guy pay two dollars a mile. I mean, I bought it with thirty five thousand <laughs> miles on it, uh, and, it, and it's for what forty sixty thousand dollars less than he paid for it. 
So this guy paid a lot of money to drive that car for those for those three years, uh, and and I paid. You know, I, I, to me that makes sense. But I but I see your point too, Miranda. Especially, and I don't find. I also disagree with financing. Uh, I don't finance cars. I don't finance anything that goes down in value. Now what? Now okay. I know what your argument then, Miranda, would be. I do. I do finance things that go down in value because the money that I'm not using to pay cash for that car, I'm making more on in the stock market. Is yeah. That right? So yeah. So for me, it's about like okay, how liquid? How liquid is everything? Right? How liquid are my assets? Uh, how much risk can I take on? And so. When I, if I use cash to buy a used car, right? So let's say I buy, I use cash, I buy a used car for $18,000. That $18,000 is gone and the car still continues to depreciate in value. I don't have access to that $18,000. It's not liquid and it's not earning any money for me. Now, if I trade in my 10 year old car and use that as a down payment and I finance a new car and I pay 35,000 for that, but I finance that over five years and I have a 2.49% interest rate. Most of my money is still liquid. It's still earning. It's earning, you know, an annualized return of 9.7% in my S&P 500 um, index fund. So it's still there. I still access, I can still access it and it's still earning money at a higher rate than the interest rate that I'm paying. So cool. it's, it's, wor it's still working for me and I have, you know, every, and, and I keep my cars for 10 years. So I drive it, the use I get out of it, the fact that I don't have to pay for repairs, the fact that by the time I get to the trade-in, it's still under warranty, so I never have to pay for any repairs. Uh, I do a dealership that offers free oil changes when you buy from them, so I don't have to pay for any of the upkeep or maintenance, so I don't have to worry about any of that. And for me, that's peace of mind. Now, what, one other thing to consider in this scenario, though, one, one other thing to add into the equation mm -hmm. is the cost of insurance is going to be higher yeah. if the car is worth more, right? So that's something yeah. else to consider. But I see your point, though, and I'm not going to argue it. I find it, it evens but. out. I mean, I still earn more money keeping it in the stock market than I'm paying in insurance. Like, I still earn more money than I'm paying out. I, I noticed, I noticed, however, that you did throw in there that it was over time the 9.7% in the S&P 500 <laughs> index fund. Because right now, you'd be better off paying, you'd have been better off paying off that car because the S&P uh, 500 I has gone down 20%. Yeah, but I'm actually still up in my personal portfolio over the 10 years that I had the car. I'm still up in my personal portfolio more yeah, well. than what I would have paid in. So I'm still up yeah. in my personal portfolio. I'm still ahead. So so we can so we'll 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 move on because we've got we've got to cover a lot of these things. But we, we can we'll, go for we'll hours. leave this one by saying generally. Okay, we, we, let me ask you this, Miranda. Would would you concede that generally speaking, for many people? It's better letting somebody else take the early depreciation on a car. Yes or no? Yeah, definitely. So I think it depends on like your temperament and whether you're truly going to keep that money in the market and whether it's truly working for you, right? A lot of people uh, go ahead and buy the new car because uh, and, and then and then they don't have that money in the market and that money isn't working for them. And so I think it really depends on your situation because for most people, like this, this entire exercise depends on making sure that you're leaving money in the market and that you stay invested. Cool. Okay, rather let's than, move on. Rather what, than what, spend. What's your, what, what's your next rule <laughs> or your next common piece of financial advice? Yeah, so this one, uh, the 4% rule, <laughs> right? Can you trust the 4% rule? So, um, you know, we've, we've looked at the 4% rule as this idea that uh, if you in, if, if you save up money in a nest egg and you limit your withdrawal to 4% of your balance each year, then your money will last indefinitely because you're accounting for like inflation, like an average of 3% inflation. And if you're very, um, if you're very conservative in how you look at, you know, stock market returns, basically you account for like a seven to eight percent stock market, annualized stock market return, then you say 3% annual average inflation, and that leaves 4%, you should be able to withdraw the money and it should last forever. So what do you think about using the 4% rule, Stacey? I, I think that the 4% rule has been exceedingly accurate since it was developed in the 1980s, I want to say, um, but maybe not so much now. 
Is that is what, what what do you think? Yeah. What do you yeah, think? I mean, I think that makes sense because well, right now infl- inflation's through the roof, so you're probably not you're not meeting that. But uh, but I also think too that um, you know the four percent rule is designed for you to have your money last forever, basically, right? And so if you don't care if you draw down your your balance and you don't care if your money lasts forever. Um, and you go by the the uh, die with zero <laughs> philosophy, then four percent rule may not apply. Good point. It, what, what would you use to replace it? Yeah. So, and that's the hard thing, right? Like, how do you make sure that you know if you do want to die with zero, <laughs> but uh, but you also want to make sure your money lasts longer than you do? Like, trying to figure that out means you actually have to spend more time with calculators and more time, you know, adjusting your targets as you go. So, as for somebody lazy like me, the four percent rule makes a lot of sense. Although I might be like, well, to meet my lifestyle, I can probably get away with five to six percent and like tweak it. What yeah. about you, Stacy? What well are you taken- using? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm actually not retired yet. I, I'm of retirement age. But, you know, my goal was always to have so much money I couldn't spend it all, period, no matter how much I took out. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I, I, don't know I, I don't know if I've accomplished that or not. But, you know, your your point is well taken, though, Miranda, about the the 4% rule suggests that you want to keep that money forever. I mean, in other words, you right. never you, you want to die with the same amount of money you retired with. And I don't have any kids. And my wife doesn't listen to this podcast, so she's not even going to know. So you know, I'll spend it all if I possibly can. <laughs> Nice. So, uh, what, oh what, yeah, you you want a new boat, right? Yeah, yeah, I want a new boat. Yeah. I want a Bentley, a used one, <laughs> but, convertible. A Bentley convertible. That's what I want. And Aaron, will, <laughs> you'll be the driver. Okay. So yeah, anyway, definitely. <laughs> let's so, let's move on before we yeah, take so the most is, break. Let's do one more. Yeah. Oh, do, so do you is, have something else to add to that? Oh no, no. I was I was going to go to the next one. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was going to I would act but I was going to say I'm actually interested in Aaron's take on this last one. One of the biggest pieces of advice people say is uh you should save 10% of your income for retirement. Uh is is that going to be enough? <laughs> and I, you yeah. know, and I'm I'm kind of interested from Aaron's standpoint of like in his own life whether he thinks that saving 10% of his income is actually enough to get by on. What do you think, Aaron? Hmm. That's a that's a that's a tough question. I actually don't know. It's a common All rule of thumb. I, yeah. And uh, I I don't I, I don't know. Do you do you save ten? First of all, let me ask both of you guys. I don't know <laughs> how much I save in my income. I save income for sure. I I right. compute my net worth at, at the last day of every single month, and I've done that for a decade. Uh, but I don't know that I my income varies all over the place because I'm self employed. Um, so I don't really know that I'm setting aside 10% of my income. Do, do you guys know for a fact how much of your income you're setting aside percentage-wise? I don't know. Actually, I don't know. I've never calculated it. I know I just live by one rule, and that is just don't buy what you don't need. Just spend less than you make. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What, what about the, you, What's Miranda? the wisdom? You, if, you, if you buy what you don't need, you steal from yourself? I mean, all three of us yeah. are self-employed, so it's, it, I would assume you guys have the same situation I do, that we all, uh, you don't know how much money you're going to make next month. So it's not, you, when you, if you have a salary, then you know, I, I make, you know, $10,000 a month, therefore I can save $1,000 a month. Um, and yeah. I, I'm not in that situation. You know, I, I save what I can. And it's worked for yeah, me. And th- and my net worth goes up every month. I mean, pretty much. Yeah. And I, I and same, same thing with me. Like, I basically, rather than using like the 10% rule and deciding how much of my income I should be saving, I actually say like, okay, how much do I need to set aside to meet my goals? Right. So, okay. If I, and I assume a very uh, conservative rate of return. So I'm like, if I want to reach my retirement goals and I, and I I assume 7% annualized returns and I want to access that money in 30 or 40 years, how much do I need to set aside each month? And I did that like back, like 15 years ago and have and have just been automatically investing since and then like same thing with like okay if i want to be able to go on these trips how much do i set aside in my travel fund that has a different rate of return because it has a different asset allocation and then how much you know do i set aside in these other investment accounts i have to reach my other goals so i look at it in terms of what kind of return am i getting or likely to get based and and what do i want to do with the money and then i set aside x amount of dollars each month and that may or may not equal somewhere between ten and twenty percent of my income each month. Well, I mean, it's, and you know, let, let's not let, let's not uh, suggest that 
it's stupid to set aside money. Obviously, right. you want to set aside as much as you can. What we're really yeah. suggesting here, and, and by the way, another thing we don't want to gloss over is that you want to do it automatically if you possibly can too. Um, right. Like I automatically do move money. Well, I, I overpay my mortgage. I automat, you know, I do things automatically so to, mm -hmm. so I make sure that I'm saving money. Uh, but the the real point here was it's ten percent enough. And the and the answer. I don't know. Is, I mean, it depends knows? on your age too, isn't it? I mean, if you start out when you're you know twenty two in your working career and you start setting aside this money, sure. But if you've never done it and you start doing it at my age, I mean, you're going to put aside a way way more than that. Yeah, well, depending on how much money you're making, too. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with saying put aside money for sure. Let, let's not suggest that there is. We're, we're just saying may, if the, the common knowledge of if you set aside 10% of your income, you're going to be fine. May not be true. You may need to set aside more than that. You may need to set aside less. Uh, you certainly need to set aside, but don't make 10% a magic number. Right. Yeah, right. definitely. You want to, you want to, 10% is a good place to start and then look at your needs and kind of decide if you need to go up from there. Well, my, my stopwatch is telling me we have to take a break now. I don't want to, but we have to. But when we come back, we're going to race through a whole bunch of them because I have 14 of these things. <laughs> and I'm going to try to get through some of them if I can. But we're, we'll be going to be right back after this. Do not move a muscle. Okay, we are back. Let me let me go through a few of mine, Miranda, and then we'll hit, mm -hmm. hit yours too. Because some of mine are going to be really fast and easy. Okay, for example, um, thinking of your home as an investment. This is something that that people often think is true, and it may and it really isn't. Your home can certainly be a store of value for you, but an investment is something you buy with the intention of selling it for more than you paid for it. Um, your home should not be that. You live in your home. Uh, it, it may indeed, at the end of the day, uh, be a store of value, but it's not really an investment. It's a place where you live. Uh, right. What, what do you think? <laughs> and now, Miranda, I know you're going to agree with this because you, you're not a buyer of houses. And in fact, that's another <laughs> thing on my list. You know, some people say renting is stupid. And actually, I'm one of those people. I don't like it. But but you do. So let's go to that. It, it, some people say renting is stupid. What do you say? Yeah. I mean, I say once again, it goes back to this lifestyle choice of your living arrangement, right? Uh, like you said, if you're thinking of your home as an investment, it's really more of a forced savings plan. Uh, by the time you, you know, repay the mortgage, pay the interest, pay the taxes, pay the insurance. I mean, depending on where you live, right? I mean, I know there are some places where you're not going to, you know, have the property taxes. But like, by the time you pay all of these things, maintenance, repairs, ongoing uh, ongoing items, um, you know, the house that you live in is probably not going to provide you as big a return as you think it is, uh, even over 30 years, um, yeah. even when housing values right. go but, up. But I've seen a lot of the stats on this too. And we've I think we've both seen a lot of people, if you, you go online, you've seen the side-by-side -side comparisons like, oh, here it is. Here's the money you would, you know, you'd save or rent or if you invested and rented versus invested and bought your home. You know, we've, we've seen those stats. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they go, oh, it comes out even, it comes, it's, it's arbitrary, you know, it's whatever. Yeah. But then there's the outliers, which is right. <laughs> like this year, you know, when your home goes up in value so much, it does become... Yeah. you know, a financial thing. Also, it's you unrealistic know. to assume that if you rent, and, and renting is way cheaper than owning, and it typically is, uh, but, but it's also kind of weird to suggest that every dime that you would have gone into a house you bought is now going to go into the stock market. I mean, that's not what's really yeah. going to happen. You're probably going to raise your lifestyle uh, to right. meet those that additional money. Yeah. Right. Uh, but right now, my mortgage didn't go up, but, but your right. rent went up. <laughs> my yeah, actually, there you go. My, my rent actually... Yeah. I'm actually going to be when I move into this apartment I'm moving into, I'm actually going to be in a better cash flow position. The rent is the same, but I won't have to like where I'm living in a house right now, I am required by my lease to keep up the yard. So I'm paying for like yard care and um, I have a larger electric bill. Well, electricity is included. Uh, all of my utilities, including my Internet, are included in my new rent. So I'm actually going to be in a better cash flow position <laughs> when I move out of this house and into an apartment in this self-contained community because uh, I'm paying the same amount of rent, but I will have more amenities and uh, less extra things that I'm paying yeah. for. So I, so I'm sense. actually going to be in a better cash flow position. Um, and I will, 
probably invest a portion of that. <laughs> and so um, just because I'm well, going to be in a better cash flow position. So I really think, but it does depend, like where are your v- values, what do you value most? My lifestyle is, you know, I've owned a home. I've done the home ownership thing. I did not care for it. And so I like convenience and I like freedom and I like flexibility. I don't like to be the one who's responsible for the repairs. Um, I like to be able to like leave without having to try and sell the house. Like I can just be like 30 days notice. Goodbye. Um, And so there's stuff like that, that I really, that I like. And so I really think that the place you live is more of a lifestyle choice that's based on your, your particular values and what works for you. Um, Now the difference of course with Aaron is Aaron owns real estate that he rents out and that's actual, that's a real investment, right? Like that's, yeah, no, that is an investment. Yeah. That's a real investment. The other thing thing too, is I'm a, I'm a DIYer. Yes. Aaron's very good. I can do the construction. I can do wiring. I can do plumbing and a whole nine yards. So that stuff doesn't scare me. So um, when, when something goes bad, I'm like, yeah, whatever. It cost me a, a few bucks for a lot of other people that don't do that stuff. That can be thousands of dollars. Um, and that's a big difference too. Yeah. Yep. So now let, let me go through a couple real quick that are going to be really simple because they're just flat out wrong. Uh, no argument. <laughs> For example, um, let's see a couple of credit card things. Um, keeping a credit card balance improves your credit score. That's wrong. Oh my gosh. Keeping, yeah, that's... keeping a balance on your credit card does not improve your credit score. It does, however, cost you a lot of money. Do not keep a balance on your credit card. It will not improve your credit score. Paying off your, your bills all the time for long periods of time, every time, is going to improve your credit score. Keeping uh, Paying the bank 18% interest is not. So that's just stupid. That's just wrong. Also, right. never using credit cards. This is common advice. Dave Ramsey gives us advice. He hates credit cards. I just went to, for, I just went to Hawaii first class on American Airlines with credit card points with my wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you can manage credit cards, yeah, they can right. be a great addition to your portfolio. Uh, if you can't, yep. then obviously they're a horrible thing to have. But to just automatically discount credit cards is wrong. Uh, credit cards can yep. be fine. They also allow you to pay later. Uh, I mean, you know, you buy, you know, you're buying stuff today, you're not paying until the end of the month, which doesn't matter when interest rates are one. Uh, or, but when interest rates are 20, it does. What's that? You just have, a, you just have an emergency. You know, like, a, I don't know, you need four tires for your car, you know, or something like that. We hope you know? we have an emergency fund for that. And as a matter of fact, let's talk about that. Um, Susie Orman says, you must have a six to, six months to a year an emergency fund. In fact, this is very common knowledge. I mean, very, very commonly said by almost anyone in this arena. Uh, and, and I say, it depends. Sounds, I mean, you sounds should, easy for Susie Orman to say. Yeah, well, I mean, you, 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 <laughs> should, you should have an emergency fund, obviously. But, the, but how much you need in an emergency fund is completely dependent on who you are. See, what I've seen a lot, you guys, is I've seen people with $30,000 in a checking account that's paying 0.1% or savings account, paying 0.1%. And then they're, and then they're paying 18% on a credit card. Well, that's stupid. Now, if you're about to get laid off, that's smart. Because you can stop paying your credit card, uh, you know, obviously in an emergency. But it, but if you've been working at the same government job for 35 years, <laughs> then you should be taking those savings and paying off that 18% credit card. I mean, you know, just look at because you're getting poorer every month that you're earning 0.1 and paying 18. Right. Uh, if you want to get richer, get rid of the 18. You know. Now again, this depends on who you are. How how steady is your income? You know, how, how much can you count on it? And that could depend, and, and that'll show you how much you may need to have uh, in, a, in an emergency fund. But you don't automatically need six months or a year. Be nice, of course, because like, as you just alluded to, Aaron, you don't want to take money out of your, out of your, um, or put money on a credit card when emergency arises. You want to, you want to have money, but yeah. uh, you don't may not just need as much as you do. If your job is steady, you may not need as much. As you might, yeah, I would say like isn't. like for for Miranda, like if you're a renter, I mean, one of the biggest headaches for renters is uh, how am I going to afford first, last, and and first, and and sometimes even put a fourth, you know, on there. So, I would say that would probably be like the biggest thing. Like all of a sudden, your landlord goes, "Oh, uh, I'm selling the house or whatever," and and you need that money to move. Um, <laughs> right. That's something huge, you know. But yeah. for most people, it's just try to figure out the the amount that you need for just random things, you know. Yeah, what could happen? Car. You know, and then, then figure it yeah. out. Obviously, if your job is unstable, the more money you've got set aside, the better. Absolutely. Yeah. No question about it. Uh, but if your job, the, the more stable your income, the less emergency funds you need. 
You should always have some, though. Oh, and by the way, speaking of Susie Orman, here's something that wasn't on my list, but I just remembered. Susie <laughs> Orman actually wrote, you, every single person should have a prenup. Everyone. No matter how old you are or how much money you have. And you know what? That's crap. Take, take it from somebody <laughs> who's done one. You know, And she actually, she literally said, a prenup, I'm not going to quote her exactly because I don't have it in front of me, but basically what she said was, a prenup is a wonderful opportunity to explore the trust you have for one another or something like that. Well, let me tell you what a prenup is. A prenup is pre-divorce. I mean, it's saying, well, here's what's going to happen if we get divorced. That, that is not any, in any way, shape, or form going to make you in, uh, in a more loving relationship. Uh, so. and, and, and also, it costs five thousand dollars, and to suggest right. that a nineteen-year-old, you know, person in college should do right. that is just stupid. It's wrong. Plus, you have to. Plus, you have to update it because over time, things change, finances change, things yeah. you buy. Things, I mean, that has to constantly be updated. So, I think a prenup again, can make sense, though, because like, oh, sure, because, absolutely. Because like, like for me personally, like, I of course I didn't have a prenup when I got married at twenty-two, and my ex and I both had yeah. student loan debt, and we're still in college. Uh, but like. But I do think a prenup can make sense, and I oh, don't a think that can make a lot of sense. Yeah, and I don't think that it's. I don't think it's. Um, saying pre-divorce and, and expecting a divorce to have one just because like you don't know what's going to happen right like i mean i assumed that i would be married forever and so of course but but you can't control what other people do so i think a prenup can be a good way to protect yourself like if i were ever to get married again which no like right now i can't conceive of such a thing but if i were to get married again i would definitely require a prenup um it wouldn't cost me five thousand dollars though i have for lawyers and my family, but I would definitely, oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's great money saving technique, get you uh, lawyers in your family. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's a good um, idea. but like, um, but I would definitely do a prenup and I would probably, and here's another thing is they say, if you get married, all of your finances should be joint. I would actually probably keep separate finances and then we'd make one joint account that we would have for our shared expenses. Um, I would not do big pot finances again, uh, having done it already once in a marriage. So, Yeah, that's a good one too, Maria. I don't know if that was on your list or not, but that's a good one too, because I, I've gone down that road too. I, this is my... Uh, never mind how many marriages it is, but my, <laughs> my, my, my wife and I have separate finances. Not because we don't trust each other. It's just that's the way we met. And, you know, we're both adults. You know, we weren't starting yeah. out together 20 years old. So, you know, and I, my money's over here. Her money's over there. I'd give her whatever she wants. You know, it didn't make any difference. But, you know, it just works for us is the point. And, and, and this is something that's common financial advice is, it, in fact, I've even read, if you loved each other, you'd have a common account. And I'm like... <laughs> Flipping the, I'm, I'm not going to do this, but <laughs> flipping right. that person off. Tell me I don't love my wife because we have separate accounts. It's just what works for us. You know? Right, exactly. And, and so so if think, your partner ever says, if you ever dare leave me, get a prenup. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and anyway, there, again, we're going back to the, very, the theme we began with. We're not saying this advice is always wrong. We're saying it's not always right. Right. You know? So and, and anyway, really, it it does come back to like what is your personal preference and and where is your comfort level and what is your risk level and what can you manage in your own personal finances? Yeah, and actually, I, I just said we're not saying it's always wrong. There are some things I just mentioned that are always wrong, like uh, keeping a credit card balance. Uh, yeah. That's that's just wrong, flat out. Uh, what else do you have, Miranda? We're going to run out of time, and I've got stuff on my list, but I know this is your oh show. Goodness. You tell me what else you've got. Yeah. So one of the things that I get a lot of crap over is the fact that uh, people say, don't pay for what you can do yourself. So I <laughs> I have somebody come clean my house. I take my car in for oil changes. Uh, I don't have to pay for oil changes anymore because my latest car came with a dealer that'll do that. But like um, – but like they say, well, learn to change the oil yourself and save your money, uh, clean your own house. Uh, I, I, I will. I am willing to pay a little bit extra to have Instacart to like deliver, like go shopping for me and deliver the groceries to me. And, and I pay for yard care. I don't want to mow my lawn. And so I think a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, like why would you pay for that? Well, because I actually value my time more. Uh, I can't get my time back. I can always make more money. And and my example that I use a lot is my house cleaner. People are like, you pay somebody to clean your house. I'm like, yes, I pay them um, 
I pay them $25 an hour to clean my house. It takes about three hours to clean my house. So that's 75 bucks um, uh, every week. So that's what $300 a month. Well, guess what? <laughs> it takes me it takes me uh, an hour to write an article that I get paid $300 for. So I can take one hour of my time. It only takes you an hour to write an article for me that, that I pay you $300 for? I'm not happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to pay, well, take just, at least two hours. <laughs> well, just remember, you're paying me for my good writing ability and my expertise, not my time. <laughs> oh, fine. Uh, let me tell so you. Anyway, that, let me take, oh, but, go ahead. Go ahead. But that's... But that's the point, right? So I, I just, I just have to take one hour to write to cover the entire month's worth of cleaning, and that saves me twelve hours a month of my time. So instead of me spending three hours cleaning the house, I can be out doing something else, and it only takes one hour of my time to like do that, and I get to buy back. 11 extra hours. I said, well, I guess if it's 12 hours minus the one hour. So I get to buy back that 11 extra hours. And for me, yeah, that's important. Yeah. And, that, and, that, and that works as long as the, the the time that's spent there, you're actually doing something else and you're not actually just, you know, going if to the movies yeah. or something and like if that. You have I mean, the money. if, if, you unless know, you want to go to the movies. She cleans, <laughs> yeah. But I'm saying, if, unless you, if she's coming over and cleaning your house and that allows you that free time that after work, you can now go and, and, uh, do some socializing that actually, you know, develops your business even more, mm -hmm. then that's a plus. Yeah. You know, you could also, you know, kill two birds with one stone. So if you're an exercise person, well, you know what, pushing the lawnmower is exercise. So instead of wasting money at the gym or whatever else, you can go, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go push my lawnmower. Or if you enjoy doing this, I mean, yeah, or, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah and, I, and I, that's I don't the mind thing, right? cleaning the house. Yeah, but it let goes me, back let to Let me tell like, you guys a story. Let me tell you guys yeah. a story. So uh, just about a month ago, my wife and I decided we uh, we needed our closets better organized because we have so much crap in them, we can't find it. Okay, so I call California Closets. And they come out and they send me a design for uh, two closets, regular closets now, big, not big walk-in closets, just regular closets. And they want like 2,500 bucks to do each one, five grand for two closets. These reach-ins. And I'm like, well, this is just stupid. You know, I've got the money. I don't care though. It's a principal thing. So I... <laughs> so, <laughs> This is three weeks ago that I'm doing this myself. And have you ever heard what it sounds like for a 66-year-old man to get up off of his knees after being on them for, for 15 minutes? Because it sounds like a water buffalo. I'm like, oh, oh, God, it's just killing me. I just hate this, you know? And, I, and then I had to go buy some more power tools. I mean, this is just stupid. $2,500 is stupid, too. But, I, I, yeah. you know, it's like I, I feel like I'm going to do this myself because, you know, I like working with my hands somewhat. I'm not Aaron, but I know how to do some stuff. But, you know, the truth be told, I'm going to do a worse job, and it's going to take me a lot longer, and it's going to make me hate myself. <laughs> it's just so, <laughs> there are things you do not want to keep doing. I mean, I, I've done my whole life, fixed up houses and blah, blah, blah. And now it's just like, I just don't want to do it anymore, even though sometimes right. I think I do. But some words of advice, though, you have to be careful about going down that hole too far. Um so, okay, so oil changes are messy, you know, it's a pain in the butt to get underneath your car and stuff like that, but although it saves you hundreds of dollars by doing this, but if you go to an oil change place, you got to be careful because if you don't know anything about your car, they're going to nickel and dime you. You're going to be mm. like, oh, you're going to need this, you're yeah. going to need this, you're going to need this, and you could walk out the door with a $600 bill when all you needed was an oil change. So um, if you do need to go to these places, make sure you do a little bit of research on what your car may need or may not need when they start pulling out these parts. Or at least get a second like, opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've heard that happen. Uh, you will walk away with less money. Yeah. I've got, I've got one more. We're, we're at 34 minutes. We try to end at 30, so we, we don't have much time. But um, I wanted to throw this one out to see what you guys thought of this. Um, let me see if I can find it on here. No. Oh, all debt is bad. That's another thing that Ramsey says. Right? All debt is bad? Right. All debt's not bad. Uh, as you just pointed out at the beginning of the show, Miranda, there's some debt. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's just as simple. Debt is bad. Debt will ruin your life. Um, however, if you're earning more than you're paying, then debt's good. I mean, leverage is good. You know, if, you, if you're buying it, if you're investing in a vacation or clothes and paying 18% interest, that's stupid. But if you're paying 8% on a mortgage on a house that's going to go up 15%, then that's smart. That makes you richer. Paying paying interest uh, on something that goes down in value makes you poor. Uh, paying interest on, on something that goes up in value by more than the interest you're paying makes you richer. So debt is not always bad. Agree, you guys? Oh, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. 100%.
Cool. That's all that's on my <laughs> list. Miranda, do you have anything else you want to throw in there really quick? I mean, I think the final one that we want to talk about for real is, you know, a lot of people believe, and I don't know whether this doesn't really come from experts or anything, but a lot of people believe that you cannot invest unless you have at least $1,000 or maybe $10,000, when the reality of the situation is that you can, in fact, start investing with your pocket change. There are lots of different uh there are different apps these days that will like automatically round up your purchases and then invest that pocket change and get you started. You, There are many apps that allow you to start investing with as little as $10 a week or $100 a month or something like that. So the idea that you need a whole bunch of money to start investing can really hold you back. And so, right, the best way to build wealth over time is to start investing somehow, right, and do it early and do it consistently and then increase how much you're investing as you become able. Well said, Miranda. Very, very good yeah. advice. Also, okay, I know I said that was it. <laughs> Some people, one common bit of advice or, or common bit of knowledge is supposed to be that investing is gambling. Investing is not gambling. Bu buying quality mm. companies and holding them on for long periods of time is investing. It'll make you rich. Uh, gambling is crypto, I might consider gambling, or, <laughs> or things that are zero sum. It's definitely a speculative asset. <laughs> when, when you're looking at something like options or futures, when the only money you can make is, somebody's, is money somebody else loses, that's literally gambling. That's, that's what Vegas is. That's what card playing is. The only money you make is, somebody, is money somebody else lost. That's gambling. That is not what the stock market is. The stock market is creating wealth by, you know, by, by investing in a company that makes products. And the more those, they sell those products or services, the more money everybody makes. Nobody has to lose for everybody to win uh, in the stock market. So that, that's why it's literally not gambling by definition. Okay, that, that's all I have. Anybody, I, I swear to God, I won't no. say anything else. You guys have anything else? I'm good. No? Okay. <laughs> we got to 14, okay, so good job us. Did we really? Awesome. Okay, I'm afraid we are out of time, folks, but we are never out of topic. Dig a little deeper. You're going to find links to lots more info in our show notes. And remember, if your goal is to make more, to spend less, to retire rich, your online home is moneytalksnews.com. And don't forget to check out Miranda's online home as well. That is Miranda Marquit, M-A-R-Q-U-I-T dot com. If you've got a question, comment, or topic you'd like to suggest, please tell us about it. It's easy to do. Just email us, hello at moneytalksnews.com. That's hello at moneytalksnews.com. And one final thing, if you like what we do, then do something for us. Subscribe to our podcast. It takes you two seconds. It really helps us, though. So if you like it, show us. Subscribe and tell your friends. I'm Stacy Johnson. I'm Miranda Marquet. A penny saved is a penny earned. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us, guys. We're going to see you right here next time. <laughs>